just like using this technology. You know, the way we are teaching is changing. This was a typical school, and actually I'm pretty sure those desks were exactly what I learned when I was in school back in the 80s. Maybe that's what we should do. We should go back to the way people taught in the 80s for the party. <laughs> well, it's either that or I have to go as a goth. I just don't have the high heels anymore. And I certainly forgot my makeup, so maybe not. However, things are changing. And the key thing is that with that change comes an evolution of what devices we're using, how we are learning, what the materials are on, where we are. And in this case, we've picked some examples of different sort of scenarios, casual group learning, two people sitting across on a table outdoors, not on the beach where I'd be with my tie or something like that, I must admit, if I had to correct a few hundred essays, can't think of a better place to be, really. Um, or someone using assistive technology. And he starts the thing, so it's changed. And one commonality here is digital. And very much as presented by myself and others, when you're thinking about digital, you're also thinking of the file. Now, it's, for those who know accessibility, it's perceivable, operable, understandable, robust. This P-O-U-R is part of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, this concept. The last one, robust, it's like a good wine. No, it's not like a good wine. Robust means that it is something that can be used on different devices with different versions and so on. Something that it's really everyone able to access it in any way that they need to. And that's usually where we just fall flat in our face as educators, because we don't actually think about the robustness of our material. Now, if you think about books, we've got in like Trinity Library, books going back hundreds and hundreds of years. You've got the Book of Kells there, which is from my hometown. I wasn't involved in it because it was from like 1800, or sorry, 872 or something like that when it was created. So that's like going on to, towards 1300 years ago. Now that's robust. People who were using those early Lotus spreadsheets, not so robust, but technology, you have to think about it. But not just for the future, for now. Because now is the future for some. So that leads into why do alternate formats? Because there isn't one format to rule them all and in e-learning bind them. Although you would think that, that PDF counts as this one format everybody does. But you know what? PDF is the last format you should think about using and sharing information. If you go to the UK government website and they talk about accessibility and how to share information with its citizens in the UK, well, of course, if you're, I'll leave the conservative joke alone for the moment. So, <laughs> yeah. So, but they say HTML, make it a web page. Web page first. PDF is really designed to be passed around so you can print stuff off. So like for our cube, we share a PDF of that because you can give it to a printer and they will print it exactly as it was designed. So all the bleed lines and whatever else, although I find that my fingers bleed when I've got paper cuts more than in printing. Um, but this is the thing, it's about students, teachers and institutions. It's about creating that robustness, creating a, well, right now I want to listen to it because I'm in a boring lecture and I just can't listen to him drone on anymore, or I'm walking along the river and I don't want to be holding a book in front of me in case I do a gavin and like fall over the edge, or you want to be able to look at it on your tablet where you've got a really good um, black and white or white on black um, screen contrast to be able to look at it in bright light. So it's the situational disability aspect which becomes important. That it mightn't be the person, it's just there's a barrier there that they want to get it over. So the alternate formats then, within our toolkit, what we do is we look at different files, pages, books, and images that they can convert. And they've got that little cool um, multicolored swirl in the middle. And they get these options for the different ones, text, audio, ebook, and braille. And so if a student says, hey, I've got a disability, they have to have an accommodation, so then teachers often are having to go and do this after the fact. And remediation 
is effort and effort is waste in this case. If it's been built really accessible in one format, then it can be transferred into others quite easily. So that's one of the key things here. But students not having to declare their disability, because they may not know, unless you want them walking around with an arrow on your head. And that, by the way, that, that phrase is actually uh, Mark Lynn from DCU, when he presented with Karen at a conference a few years ago. He walked around for the whole conference with a headband and an arrow sticking into his head, just to try and get the point across point, arrow, stuff. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> jokes. Um, but people came up to him and go, what's the arrow for? And he went, come along to the workshop. So maybe we should have done that for this one. But it is about they shouldn't have to if it's accessible and convertible by default. So when you think about it, OK, you know, there's different text formats. So you're going to have PDF, because you can have an accessible PDF you probably need a PhD in Acrobat, Adobe Acrobat Pro, um, and of course a license for it, because if you have a really accessible Word document, turn it into a PDF, and then the fun begins. It does take effort, as, as it should. All good things take effort, doesn't it? But then you've got audio, and the interesting thing about audio, we were talking about quickly speaking or slowly speaking earlier, and one of the really cool accessible concepts is giving people enough time to listen and comprehend what you're saying. Okay? Listen and comprehend, or read and comprehend. So consume and comprehend and think about it. And when we do re MCQ quizzes and stuff, and they've got one hour to do, 25 questions, it sort of goes against that, because you're forcing people to act under pressure. And not everyone necessarily thinks at the same pay pace, or comprehends at the same pace, but also listening at the same pace is equally important. I listen to audiobooks, and I like the, the pedal to the metal on this one. I like them faster than average. However, someone who's learning in a second language, someone who has a learning difficulty, they might want to choose a slower language. And having, or slower, not slower language, is there any? Um, maybe if you're drunk. However, but a certain slower speed. But offline players don't often offer different speeds. Or if they do, they're hidden away in the settings that you don't know exists. I found out recently that a player I use does have a speed option. It was just hidden behind five menus to turn it on. So offering the audio in different speeds is a good thing, because online ones force them to stream, which isn't great if you're using data. And ebooks is different formats. There's not just one to rule them all there either. Giving them the formats, but I hit 45 and I suddenly needed these to read. It wasn't great. I hate glasses. Really hate wearing glasses. So much so that I have a, I am, I have a habit of lo losing them and forgetting where I've put them down. And that's it. But then I want to have my font bigger on my ebook when I'm putting it on my tablet to make it easier to read so I don't need to wear my glasses. And then Braille. There's a multitude of Braille formats. A multitude. And that is the thing. You want to be able to support all of those. So when you're looking at different text formats, it has to be accessible. And if, it, if, you don't, if, you're not, if you're not mindful, if you're not focused on it, you're going to create documents, and especially older ones, which are just unusable to people nowadays. Did you know that Microsoft Edge has a screen reader built into it, as does Firefox, as does Chrome, as does Safari? They're all starting to have screen readers, or readers built into them. And if the, if the content is unreadable, as it was when I was doing a session with a teacher recently, their PDF literally started at the second page, and it read the footer. It then read the heading on one of the other pages, and that was it on an eight-page document. The rest of the content wasn't surfaced to the reader, even if, unless you did OCR, which is optical character recognition, where you get AI in there. It's been around a lot. I know, I, I, I know that this AI is like, everyone's talking about how good it is, and it is helpful sometimes. It can be. And this is one of the areas where it's really useful. But you do want to make sure that those formats are going to be something used, because the different types of text. Why would people want to use this? Why do they want to use a docx instead of a PDF? Well, docx means they can use immersive reader. Do people know what immersive reader is? Okay. Well, afterwards, suggest if you use Word or even if you use Microsoft Edge, 
you can use Immersive Reader. It allows the student or the reader to reformat the content in different ways to suit them, like putting a color swash behind it to change the color contrast, or to make it narrower. One of the things which I really wish there was a huge PR campaign from Moodle of why they made the course area narrow in Moodle 4, that's a readability thing. If you go to Medium, BBC, Guardian, any of the big media platforms that are literally trying to push content at you, the, part, the lines don't go very long because reading from line to line, you want to keep it narrow. But it was a PR campaign that really, from a usability and an accessibility point of, point of view, needs to be done for Moodle. But then who will use the different formats? Because PDFs can be used and they can be tagged, which means that a heading is set as a heading or a paragraph is set as a paragraph. The images have alt text, like you can do in Word. But there's also that sometimes when you have a Word document, you've lots of tables. Now, tables are harder to do in PDFs. In Word, they're not so bad. It's a bit like Excel, and they can be set to be read as a table. Problem is, most of the time you find a table in a Word document, it's for layout, not for data. But then you've also got equations and formulas, and that's, again, one of the things that people might use it. So there are so many different ways of you can play text. So Edge and often browsers now will display a docx or a PDF in the browser rather than downloading it. I don't like that personally, but it makes it easier for people to read. So when people are converting from a PDF using our system, they can go to Doc, Excel, maybe it's a PDF of spreadsheets. Can't imagine a, different, a, a worse way to share a spreadsheet. Well, sharing a spreadsheet is pretty nasty anyway. Um, sorry, I, I'm in Excel, Excel person, I love it, but uh, no one else seems to. RTF, that really old format, but that's certainly robust, it's still around. Tagged PDFs, plain text, comma separated, HTML. Another nice way, you can just give them a HTML page and they can read the text on it. Why not? They can just save it to their, to their desktop or to their phone. DocX and Excel. And this is that immersive reader thing I was talking about. You know, you, over there on the left-hand side, the option for column width. I love it, the page color, but also line focus. I mean, I remember as a kid seeing people using a ruler to help remove the distraction of the sentences or lines afterwards as they were reading. This does a digital equivalent and blacks out the page apart from the one line of text or two or three that you're reading through. Also adds spacing, which again helps neurodivergent learners because if all the words are too close together, especially if they're all caps, that makes it so hard to read. And of course it will read it aloud. And that's something that's obviously built into, into Office. However, then you've also got it built into Word or built into Microsoft Edge, the browser. And then it can have really cool things because it can also add in, whether it's a verb, and adding in all of these extra bits to help readability and learning language, which I do love. I think it is just so cool. So here, this is an example where it's colored in non-competing colors, as it happens. The study of earth, land, forms, it, and so on. It's different nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. So it's showing a label and it's showing color. So it's not using color alone for meaning. Another really good thing in documents. Saw a document there recently where they had so much color, it looked like a rainbow. It just couldn't be read. It looked pretty though. So. And the way, and then how about a book in Moodle? So. You build content in HTML, you add in your graphics and all that content, and then you actually have it that it can be downloaded as either a PDF or a book. So you're allowing them read it online in a native HTML web format, but then take it away with them. I think that's really important because, you know, if you think about it, when old face-to-face -face classes and whatever, you had a handout that you'd get, having the handout online is good, but having it as web online is better. And then they can print it if they want to. And I'm certainly one of those people who likes printing stuff to be able to really read it and annotate it, because PDFs aren't great for annotation. And then what about audio? You know, I was at a conference a few weeks ago where I saw, noticed someone sitting in one of the rows with their headphones on, and they were listening to a football match. OK, 
Okay, so that's one way you can use audio, I guess. However, it's not necessarily the only way and certainly not the best way to use audio. Because when we think about audio, people might need to. It's like learning styles don't exist. We all know that if they've been debunked. But some people might require to consume via audio because they're dyslexic and their reading speed is very slow. So they take it in better in audio or take it in at all via audio. And that's really important. It isn't about preference or style, it's about need. Just like if I'm walking along. Now I used to learn chess moves when I was a kid, or a kid, younger, should we say, half a life ago. And I'd walk around with a, a chess openings book in my hand, learning all of these positional moves to, um, because I, wanted, I thought I'd be a brilliant chess player. It wasn't a brilliant one, I was, I was average, but I did walk into a few poles and like lampposts on the street while I was walking around with a book. So possibly not the best way to consume content on a busy street. But listening to it would also have been better as long as I'm aware and I don't walk out in front of traffic that I don't hear anymore. So any bit of content walking along the street. But if you're in, if you're in a bus, if you're in a train, this kind of way is going to be a nice way to do it. You're not going to be reading and getting sick. So it is an important thing. It's about sequential text. So if you're asking people to jump around different bits of content, this doesn't work quite as well. Unless it's something like a series of small chapters. And when I used to go, when I started off doing selling years ago, I had a podcast series by sellingbigger.com or something like that. And it was just these little three minute, just in time training sessions that you do before a sales meeting or something like that. So that was really good content, small snippets, learning nuggets, audio works really, really well. So it's typically shared as an MP3. Um, but why, do they, why do you use that format? Because it's just easy for people to use. Devices use it all. If any of you have ever been bored in Google my history, I used to work in telecoms and I was interviewed many years ago talking about video formats. And eventually this would all come down to one and the video format wars, if everyone remembers the, the, all the different formats 20 odd years ago, that that would stop. Well, it did stop. You know, MP3 and MP4s are pretty much the standard out there. But why do you, wh who will use it? Everyone will use it. So just download, because everything plays it nowadays. This is easy, just all devices are using it. So the benefits is quite simple, that it's, it's fast to download. If you don't do it in full-blown stereo with lots of extra stuff, the size isn't very big either. So that's better, certainly smaller than video. And pretty much every device has at least one bit of free software built into it that will play this. That's great. That's robust, isn't it? So when you think about it, you will have that person sitting in a bar or someone in the middle there driving a car and listening to it. Someone running. Luckily, they're looking forward and not down into a book. And then, of course, there's some other people sitting on a bus or a train or whatever it might be. And it just it changes the scenario because all of those have barriers for being able to consume the content on a laptop or in your hand as a printed book or whatever it might be. And it's about reducing those barriers. And with an hours then, you have those seven speeds that your people can choose depending on what their need is. It's their need at that time. Because they might want it in different speeds at different times. Just like they might use different formats at different times. And then there's a multitude of languages there. Love, I love that word, multitude. I should really give out um, a free cube for every time I say it. What about ebooks? So I love ebooks. I've got a Kindle. We moved in January. I found it again, having lost it for four years, because I now just use my iPad Pro. You know, Kindle, great idea, fits in the hand, lovely, simple, very effective. Just hated it. <laughs> but. I've got an ebook reader on my iPad, so I'm happy. But it is about having that easily thing to, easy thing to read where you can really control the layout and size and everything. Again, control. People who want different formats, they want control. And there are different formats. Um, Moby, should know we there, but anyway. So that was the old format for Kindle. You have EPUB, multiple variations there. Why use them? Because they're just easy and they work on pretty much every device. Although, ironically, with Windows, you really have to choose a good reader if you want it. Um, I've used so many over the years. I'm not sure what the best one is now, but I have one that's installed some years ago. 
And I think the one, one reason I like these formats is they're not dependent on extra software like Word or Google or whatever it might be. It's just a simple reader. And again, most mobile devices have something that will all already work with it. And the benefits is they're searchable as well. Especially with a book. The fact you can search just within a book because it downloads the whole thing as one entity, not each chapter by chapter. And then there's plenty of tools available for these kind of things. And when we're looking at it, we let them choose the format and that base font size to make it a little bit bigger. Supersize your ebook. For those who didn't laugh, which was all of you, that's a joke about McDonald's. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, jokes just don't go across cultures. Or maybe my, my dad jokes are just dad jokes. Um, and of course then you've got a braille device so if you want to download a format being able to use that braille device is really important when you see people using these it's just an experience you need to understand how they use the assistive technology because even if you learn how to use it you're not using it the way that person, someone who depends on that technology for interaction and so people using the format well you're going to have people who are oops you know, people who are, are blind and who either choose not to um, use audio or perhaps they just prefer it through a braille reader or perhaps they are deaf or hard of hearing. And the benefits of it is that they, they can actually engage with the content. Yes, it, it may take them slightly longer, just like, you know, it takes just the average person sometimes longer than we think to actually read and comprehend content, especially if it's complex. I remember one lecturer that I was working with who had 30 questions to answer in a one hour quiz. And I read out, out loud, the question of the first, the first question, and then each of the options, and then talked through my thought process. It was over three minutes for the first question. And I knew the subject really well, but I was debating about which was the right answer and so on, as we would be thinking about it. He changed his time limit to two hours after he did some of them himself as well and realized a big lump of text is just so, so useful. But anyway, so time is important. And we enable the user to choose exactly how they want to configure their Braille file because it's their file it's for their use on their device. We don't dictate it. Which if we only give PDFs and have no conversion options at all, we're telling them that that is how they have to consume the content and figure it out themselves. If we give them an image, locked PDF, well one, they're probably gonna Google how to unlock a PDF, which for those who don't know, it's as easy as this. You open it up in Google Chrome and you print from Google Chrome, and now you have an unlocked PDF. Third option, if you search for how to unlock a PDF on google.com. So 10 year old will figure it out. So alternate formats, one of the things you think about is storage. Not everybody uses them, but sometimes your content's in an accessible format, so people just use it that way. And we found that courses which promote this, the students embrace it, absolutely embrace it, and audio just goes off the scales in usage. But then you've also got ownership. You have to teach them about copyright and go, this is for you, not for you to put on the web. Which is a good thing, because they should, as part of their digital literacy and their digital skills, understand copyright and for personal use versus sharing use. So, let's think about it. Why alternate formats? Because you're enabling the user to make decisions themselves about how and when they will use what format. It's that ease of use. It's autonomous, but it's also anonymous because we don't log, with our tool anyway, we don't log who does it, but we just log that it was done. And how, well, um, in our toolkit there's an option for it, but there's other ways of doing it as well. And this feeds into UDL. So, thank you everybody. If you have any questions, please let me know.
Hi, Gav. Um, thank you for that. Really interesting. I found the plugin. We're definitely going to investigate it because we have accessibility needs that need resolving. I remember a few years ago talking at an event and you were there and I was talking about, I think, H5P a lot and you challenged me on the accessibility of H5P. Yeah. And rightly so. <laughs> and it's great that you're still fighting that cause. Um, my question is really about that. How, for those organizations that use tools like RISE, Storyline, H5P, how can we promote better accessibility of those? I have various students that want to use screen readers on a RISE lesson and it's very, very challenging for them to do that. Oh, it's cumbersome would be a nice way of putting. So if you've got SCORM, you know that, that lovely word SCORM or H5P package? I mean, the first thing is, both of these are zip, basically zip files with stuff inside them in formats that are technically good. But, I mean, H5P, if you ask them as an organization, do you have an accessibility checker for your H5P content? The answer is, well, you can ask them on the way out. <laughs> They're just there, I think, or is it just there? Ask them. All of you go up, get sad around, and get them to do something. They build the content. If they can't get it to be accessible, I don't know who can. Well, we are looking at it. It's one of our projects for end of year that we're going to have someone explore. But we might actually have to deploy it and then check it in a deployed state. I mean, that's scary. That's a lot of effort and cost involved technically to do that kind of thing. The same with SCORM objects. They are not accessible because people choose to use all the cool, sexy, interactive stuff that's visually nice. And a blind lecturer told me, Gavin, you know what? Do you know how to detect if someone's going to create inaccessible content before they create the content? Can anyone guess? Go on. They said they want it interactive. Pardon? They say they want it interactive. No, interactive. You can do really cool interactive stuff. They want it to either look good, <laughs> OK? or be on brand, but basically if they choose one sense, one sense as their metric, so that it sounds good, it looks good, it feels good, if one sense, that means it's not going to be inclusive, as a general rule. And think about when you, when you hear people about their planning their content, oh, I want the layout to be look really good and um, use all our brand color, or whatever it is, and it's because they don't understand that the content should be content, right? And in some ways, a, um, a, a similar lecturer told me, you know, Gavin, color doesn't survive printing into black and white, which most of us print in black and white. Does anyone print here in color? We have one, we have two. Okay, do we have three? Do we have three? No, <laughs> two. So all those lovely colors that you add into your content, printed and they're gone. So you need to think about the content. So for H5P, we're looking at it. For SCORM, there's a one line at the beginning of the perceivable part of WCAG. It says, a text alternative for any non-text content. And that is the most important thing for you to take away from this session. A text alternative for non-text content. A SCORM is a non-text, primarily. Give them a good Word document, all the content, full transcript of the videos, all the content in a nice docx or a web page. Right? That is how you make the content accessible, how you make the tools accessible. Well, ask Articulate, they've spent a lot of money not succeeding yet. Um, although they're better than some. But if, if, you, if you were to ask me now, one tool to do all that, use Xerte. That's X E R T E. That creates accessible content.